This lecture is being brought to you in part by the generous gifts of these sponsors. Well, thank you. It's a great honor to be here tonight, and uh, welcome to the Magical Mystery Macrophage Tour. You know, when I, I uh, decided on the name for this talk, there's a certain subset, much younger, um, group of people who didn't know what I was talking about. <laughs> so that was rather sad to me. Now, um, when, when I uh, was preparing for this presentation, I um, would be, you know, trying to tell my, my colleagues that, uh, you know, this was something that I had been working on and was very excited about. And um, most of the reactions that I got from them uh, would be, what? <laughs> or, why? So, you know, that was rather demoralizing. And um, I went home that night and I thought about it and I said, you know what, then, you know, my goals for today's talk would be to answer those two questions. Okay, what are macrophages? And why am I spending so much time um, and, and, you know, using up one hour of your precious time uh, to talk about this, all right? So for our tour today, we will start with um, a general introduction so I can give you a little bit on the characteristics and functions and the origins of this very fascinating cell. And then I will move on to a very brief overview of their role in physiologic and disease conditions, okay, my own windshield tour, so that uh, you get a sense of the range and diversity of these little uh, creatures. And then I will spotlight specific macrophages in um, some uh, tissues and uh, just kind of give you more of a sense of how much they are involved in uh, creating uh, disease and also homeostatic conditions in our body, and then I'll just summarize, all right? And if we're very lucky, we may actually get to um, see feeding time at the macrophage zoo. So if that happens, you know, we're in, in luck. So let's get going. All right, you can't talk about macrophages and not reference this guy. He's Eli Mechnikov, and um, he's famous because the myth is that he was looking under the microscope at a starfish that had in been impaled by a rose thorn, and he saw these creatures that were swimming around and seemed to be gobbling things up, right? And as a result, he named them macrophages, which comes from the Greek for big eater. And so if you think of them as big gobblers, that's a good idea of uh, at least one of their general functions. Now for a long time, uh, macrophages were kind of, you know, not very well respected. They were seen as this brute cell, kind of like Godzilla over there. And um, because all it did was just gobble up foreign particles and uh, maybe pathogens. And while that might be helpful, it's really not very impressive. And when we were um, studying immunology, there's a whole lot more attention given to T cells and B cells because, you know, they make antigens and they're very important for vaccine development. So these things, well, yeah, they're useful, but not really very sophisticated, right? Rather brute cells. They're well known, as um, Mechnikov noticed, for this process of uh, cell eating or phagocytosis. And you can see here that um, this, uh, my pointer is working. Well, if you look uh, at the um, macrophage or, uh, in, in brown, as it's coming upon this food particle and it's extending what look like arms around it, and then it encircles it and forms a little compartment called uh, a vacuole. And then you see the little green bubbles there, and those bubbles contain acid and enzymes, and when they fuse with the vacuole, they help digest whatever is inside. Okay? And this is really what happens when uh, the macrophage or other cells are phagocytosing. Ooh, we are lucky. We did get to feeding time at the macrophage zoo. So before before we um, you know get going here, can make sure you keep your hands in. Do not stick out any limbs. I don't want anything to be missing here. And you'll 
look very carefully. My pointer does not seem to be, yeah, there it is. This area as um, a little extension comes out and it's grabbing the bacteria and bringing it back into the cell. Chomp, chomp, <laughs> goodbye. All right, so where do these fascinating cells come from? Uh, when I was in medical school, really just a brief while ago, um, we were taught that uh, they came from the bone marrow. And uh, you can see there that these bone marrow cells, uh, we start with a stem cell here called the hematopoietic stem cell, and then it divides into two lines. So you have the myeloid line and the lymphoid uh, line. And eventually that myeloid line develops into what we call here the innate system, and then the lymphoid line develops into the adaptive system. So the innate system is your ready-made defense system. So the way you could think about it is if you want to buy something to wear, you might just go into a store, a retail store, ready-made, look at something on the racks, pick out a color, a design, a size that you like, and if it fits, you pay for it, you could wear it, and uh, right there and then, it's ready to go. Okay? And that's what happens with the innate system. We have our defenses in the innate system ready to go so that if you are attacked by a pathogen or you encounter some toxin, you can immediately have those resources available to counter them. The adaptive system is more like your tailor-made system. And what you would want to do is go to a tailor and get your measurements made specifically uh, for your body. You can pick the design, you can pick the color and the fabric, and have something uh, cut out and made for you uh, that is of your specific choosing, all right? And that is where the T cells and B cells reside. Um, and the adaptive system, however, as you can imagine, takes a longer time to mobilize. So it's gonna take something like a week before they're ready to come out and defend you. So we really do depend, as much as maybe we look down on this side, uh, or we have uh, for a long time, we do depend on that innate system to keep us safe in the immediate period. Now, from that um, hematopoietic stem cells, it's just another way to look at it, we have this monocyte, right, and this can develop into different cell lines of which the macrophage is one. All right, so the takeaways here so far are that, well, macrophages are really good at eating, and they are formed in the bone marrow from those cells that are called monocytes. Now, when I mention macrophages, um, a lot of people kind of screw up their eyes and go, I have never heard of these things. And that's because they often go incognito in the different tissues in our body. And they take on different names or pseudonyms just so that we won't recognize them when they're there. So I'm gonna point out some macrophages in the body and some of you might be surprised that they are actually macrophages in hiding. You hear a lot of talk about microglia and these are the immune cells in your brain. Uh, so you can see one right here. Uh, am I using? Okay, let's go back. Uh, on, the, on the right, uh, it's got these spindly arms that are you know, sticking out. These are the immune cells of your brain and they are really important in the um, development of diseases such as Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, right? And they're also very important in protecting uh, the brain from damage, as we'll see a little later. We also have um, macrophages that are hiding in the bone. So the primary bone uh, cells that we see are uh, osteoblasts and osteocytes, which are involved in bone formation and maintenance. But what breaks down bone would be this cell called the osteoclast. And very few people recognize it as a macrophage. It looks quite different from the regular macrophages, but it certainly is a macrophage. And we're very... Um, interested in uh, osteoclasts because if we can figure out how to control that bone degradation that happens with these cells, then perhaps we could address diseases such as osteoporosis, right? 
Now, these are Langerhans cells, and these are, again, the macrophages that you would find in the skin. And uh, there's one, right, hiding in there. And uh, they're very good. Now, if you, if you think of the skin, there's a mucosal surface, uh, and, and a, it's a barrier between the outside world and uh, obviously your inside, right? And that's where you want your immune cells. So these Langerhans cells, uh, which is another name for these macrophages in the skin, are always sampling and, and uh, checking out the environment outside and trying to detect if that uh, skin surface has been broken and if we're under attack by any pathogens. Okay? We have other macrophages in the skin that we call dermal macrophages, and um, they have a strong link with tattoos. <laughs> <laughs> So we know that once you get a tattoo, well, you know, it's pretty permanent. They're very hard to remove. And the reason for that is when the, uh, the ink gets uh, put into your skin, these macrophages will go and do what? What are they good at? Eat it. Yes, they will eat and swallow that ink. Okay, And they're quite long-lived. So they're going to stay there. And when they die, guess what? Other macrophages come and eat them and the ink that's in them. Right? And so I know I saw that. She just went, <laughs> yeah, so, and as a result, yeah, you know what, you really do want to plan ahead if you want a tattoo. <laughs> now, these are uh, kupfer cells, and they are the um, very famous macrophages that are in your liver. And uh, we're going to come back to the kupfer cells uh, because they're important for many, many functions. Obviously, your liver is really important, so you want to defend that liver really well. But it may surprise you what other things um, uh, these kupfer cells may be doing. So you can see that pretty much all tissue in your body will have macrophages in them. Right? So I showed you um, the microglia in the brain. And then you have uh, the alveolar macrophages are in the lung. You have them in the liver, the kupfer cells, and uh, maybe in the intestines and so forth. Right? So they're really everywhere in the body. Now, when I was preparing this talk, um, someone said to me, well, I thought most of these uh, immune cells are floating around in your blood. And actually, no, they're really in your tissue. Okay. <clears throat> now, it turns out that some of the macrophages that I talked to you about, instead of originating from your bone marrow, they have a different origin. And that is from the yolk sac. Okay. So as the embryo is developing, you'll see here, this, this part is the yolk sac, which supports the embryo in the early part of development, right? And the yolk sac itself uh, will form these you know, really primitive progenitor cells that will, uh, it, this is in mouse right? models, it will seed the part of the embryo that develops into the brain into the central nervous system, very early in development. And those specific cells, those immune cells, will become what we call the tissue resident cells in the central nervous system. And uh, we call those specifically microglia. And those cells, you know, they develop so early um, in the embryo, but uh, they will persist, you know, for many, many years, and they are self-renewing. So they do not need that, uh, the bone marrow monocytes uh, for regeneration. They can self-reproduce. So these are very, very special macrophages. Now, a little bit later in development, then we have the second wave here. I always keep, yeah, here we go. The second wave of these myeloid progenitor cells that now go to the fetal liver and, and uh, seed the liver, and remember those kupfer cells? Yeah. Another tissue resident macrophage, and uh, those uh, start to develop in the liver. And then from the liver, uh, we send out these progenitor cells right, to other tissue. So you can see their lung, but kidney as well, right? skin. And these become tissue resident macrophages, as you can see here. And this is a very special subset of macrophages. And they are quite different from this set here, right, that comes from the bone marrow. Okay. So uh, just to show you how the kupfer cells are made, as the um, 
the myeloid cells go to the liver, they come into contact with, here's in purple, the Kupfer cells, and they come into contact with the green cells, right, which are the hepatocytes, and the blue are the sinusoids uh, of the liver, but you see the lining there is in blue because those are cells, the endothelial cells. Notice this macrophage here, it seems to be touching the green and the blue, right? And the reason it's doing that is while it's reaching out its arms and touching them, it's getting special signals that will inform it to be a special liver macrophage, a tissue resident macrophage. And that's really how it knows that it is a Kupfer cell. Okay, it will develop because of the signals that are coming from um, the other cells around it. Oh, I, didn't, I forgot this moves. There we go, <laughs> right? And you can see it's really kind of sensing, like almost caressing all the other little cells around. All right, so again, just to emphasize that you have two now origins, two sources here. You have this bone marrow, right? And eventually they become monocytes and then these macrophages here. But you have that earlier wave and those are macrophages as well, but they are the special tissue resident macrophages. <laughs> All right. Now, when we talk of macrophages, most people who work with macrophages really kind of sigh at this point when you see a slide like this. Uh, because we, we will all, you will often hear people talk about M1 or M2 macrophages. And this is really um, kind of more like fantasy land. This doesn't really exist. But it's a useful concept to have. Okay? So M1 macrophages, as you can see here, if you have a macrophage here, it can be polarized, and that's the word you'll hear, into different states. Right? One might be this M1 macrophage state. And this is where uh, they're really good at killing. Right? Uh, they do the gobble-gobble. They're kind of like the Godzilla. And it's a very inflammatory state. So this is great if you have, let's say, bacteria that you need to kill. You really want them to be in this angry um, Hulk state. And then you have, what's his, was it Bruce Banner? Yeah, you want the little quiet guy with, with the spectacles on, right? And this is the M2 state. And this is um, often thought to be anti-inflammatory, and it has other functions as well. Now, uh, I'm bringing up this slide because macrophages are really good at helping us deal with some of the organisms that are in our environment, in this case, worms. You might think you want to get rid of, I know, I know some of you are really <laughs> grossed out by this, but so you might <laughs> wonder why we would want to get along with worms, but obviously it's a great kumbaya moment for the macrophages. And um, believe me, it, it has benefits uh, to us, all right? Because when we have, um, uh, worms in our body, we actually activate a kind of um, program in our immune system that is called type 2 immunity. And type 2 immunity is a, a, a kind of a tolerance program, and it's an anti-inflammatory program. And it helps you not rev up in, uh, inflammation in your body or to control inflammation in your body. Now, obviously, when you have something like hookworms in your body, it's going to cause a lot of damage. Have you ever seen the teeth of hookworms? Yeah, I will spare you. But uh, it can cause a lot of tissue damage right, in your lungs and in your intestines and so forth. And you need um, a, 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 a sort of an anti-inflammatory state and a wound healing state to deal with the damage uh, that comes with having hookworms in you. And as a result, your body will uh, make sure that you have this anti-inflammatory state right, and not rev up your inflammation because every time you get uh, some kind of parasitic uh, infection and you rev up your uh, immune system to be inflammatory, that's going to cause a whole lot of damage in your body. Okay? Also, when we are in this um, sort of tolerance mode, uh, we also impact uh, the metabolism in our body. In this case, we increase energy expenditure. So, you know, there is this mythologic weight loss method of ha is swallowing earthworm, um, hookworms, right? But yeah, I will not be promoting that. <laughs> right, and where, when we're talking about that tolerance program, I am actually talking about this M2 function here that you see, 
This is correct. Yeah, the M2 function, the anti-inflammatory functions here. You see that it, it, we have clearance of parasites here. Uh, M2 functions are not always good. Being anti-inflammatory is not always good because you don't want to tolerate things like tumors. And if you have too much of that tolerance program going, then you might not be as aggressive in your response to tumors, right? But um, we also need the uh, M2 uh, state for tissue remodeling, for forming new blood vessels, and forming new connective tissue for wound healing, in fact. OK, so uh, let me play this. And, uh, here we see, actually, this is damage that is done in, uh, in, the, in the brain. And I want you to, uh, hopefully I can, sorry, can we go back? Yes. Let me just try and get my pointer to work here. Watch somewhere around here. And you'll start to see a honeycomb shape forming. You see that, this honeycombing? And what you're seeing are these um, macrophages that are surrounding other cells to protect them from damage. And now you see them in their phagocytic or more M1 mode, where they're swallowing up debris in the brain. Okay, so you can see that you know you have one state where they're protecting the cells and they're surrounding the cells, protecting them from damage. But you have that other uh, phase where they're actually swallowing up whatever damaged tissue is around. Okay, so again, they have two origins: bone marrow and embryonic yolk sac. Where they come from, whether it's from the embryo or whether it's from the bone marrow, is going to influence their function and phenotype. Where they implant, whether it's in the liver, in the kidney, the signals from other cells in those tissue will influence their function and phenotype. And you know, we just saw that they can be polarized into different states. Now, uh, here I'm showing you, this is an artist's representation of what's going on in the brain of um, developing children. So at birth, you'll see you have some neurons there, but clearly, by six years old, you have a whole lot more density of neurons and synapses. Okay? But look what happens at 14 compared to six, a lot less, right? Guess what? Those microglia are really important in pruning during development, pruning of the brain during development. And if they don't do it correctly, we can have diseases such as perhaps schizophrenia, right? There's a lot of research around microglial pruning, aberrant pruning um, in development of those diseases. So what they do is they somehow detect the synapses that are not being used, the inactive ones, and we get rid of those. We nibble away, we eat them, and done, okay? But the ones that we use frequently, we're going to actually support, right? And we're going to consolidate some of those uh, synapses. So that's really what happens in pruning. And sex differences matter. Anytime you are talking about macrophages, you want to know, and if it's a good study, they will always tell you, this is in males, this is in females. So even if it's an animal model, they should tell you male or female. Uh, this study was really interesting. They were looking at play behavior in mice. And in the male mice, they have more aggressive uh, ways of playing as compared to the female mice. And what they discovered was that the microglia in the developing uh, brains of the, the male mice uh, were actually chomping away at newborn neurons and very aggressive pruning in one area of the uh, brain, uh, in, the, in this case, the amygdala. Right? And that was what was causing that aggressiveness in play. Uh, that didn't happen in the female mice. But if they manipulated the microglia to do that pruning in the female mice, you would then see that aggressive uh, play behavior. Right? So behavior can be influenced by these uh, microglia and how they prune your brain. Oh, this one is... You're going to see two types of macrophages here. So the first set, um, once the red, which is where the blood vessels are, goes away, you're going to see these worm-like green things. Okay, And these are meningeal macrophages. They're in the coverings of the brain. See how worm-like they are. Now, these are microglia. They are also macrophages. But remember, they are from the embryonic yolk sac. So these are tissue resident cells. And look at their shape. You'll see they're more star-like. They have a lot more arms, right? And they're very different in function and even in form. 
So even in one tissue in the brain, I'm showing you different subsets here now of macrophages. So takeaways, they are involved in development and also disease formation. Sex differences really matter when you're talking about macrophages. And these different populations of macrophages look and act very differently. All right, so now here's the windshield tour. I'm just going to rush through a few slides to tell you, um, you know, how macrophages may be involved in um, physiology and disease in your body. So, you know, they are uh, definitely involved in osteoarthritis. And again, uh, this is probably not all there is to it, but there's a sense that there, we have more of these M1 macrophages that have a pro-inflammatory program that destroy joints, okay? Um, and, and cartilage, but they're also really important in regeneration of cells, in this case in cartilage uh, regeneration. You can't come to IHMC and not talk about muscle, right? So I just threw this one in. Um, but they are really interested in, uh, I mean, I, I know at IHMC they are, uh, looking at macrophages and how um, they're activated um, in relation to to exercise in relation to muscle damage. Um, if we're trying to regenerate uh, skeletal muscle, for example, we really have to look at macrophage action because they influence the stem cells in regeneration. This one's really in interesting because they took engineered skeletal muscle from adult-derived uh, adult uh, muscle cells from, from mice, rats actually, injured it, and then they put it in a broth of regenerative you know, signals and molecules, and nothing happened. If you, if you use um, the uh, muscle cells from, from uh, young mice, neonatal mice, then you get nice regeneration, but the adult ones you don't see any, until you add in macrophages, and then all is well. So you can see that these macrophages are really important, even in um, regeneration of cells. Parkinson's disease, uh, neurodegenerative disease, as you're all aware. And again, the idea is that if you have an M1 uh, type of expression, then that can be neurotoxic. But you could have a neuroprotective function if we are in that M2 state. In the eye, right, um, uh, a lot of the age-related uh, alterations uh, that we see and the diseases that we see, for example, age-related uh, macular degeneration, really um, are because of the actions of microglia. Now, I, I hope you realize that the eye is really um, an, uh, the outpouching of your brain. So it's really your brain sticking out, right, into the eye socket. And so that's why we also have microglia in the eye, right, because those are central nervous system tissue resident cells. So they are present in all tissue and are involved in the development of chronic diseases. All right, now we're going to just look at some specific uh, diseases. And uh, the one I chose here is Alzheimer's. Now with the progression and development of Alzheimer's, so far what we know is we see uh, this deposit of these proteins called beta amyloid proteins, and these are extracellular, so they're outside the cell body, okay? And uh, after this stage, it seems to, when you have a lot of these, these extracellular beta amyloid proteins um, aggregating, then it seems to facilitate uh, these intracellular hyperphosphorylated tau proteins. Then these proteins now start to gather and gunk up the insides of cells. And then the next stage is neuronal loss, which is clearly correlated to cognitive decline. So I'm going to show you this slide here. This kind of emphasizes the time course. You have the preclinical time course, but you can see that we start with the, um, the uh, uh, beta amyloid deposits in the brain outside the cells, and at the same time, your microglia are activated, right? So they get stimulated. And um, once we kind of reach a peak, with the beta amyloid, you start to see now in the blue line the tau proteins accumulating inside the cell, right? And with that, we also see the loss of neurons and synapses in the brain. And once we do that, we're in the symptomatic phase here. Okay, so let's just focus on this side here, B, right? So 
When uh, you have these deposits in the red here would be those amyloid plaques, right? What we see would be these microglia surrounding that plaque. Okay, and if you have microglia that you kind of um, make deficient in certain ways, uh, they don't function normally, then they're unable to surround the amyloid plaques. Now, what we see here is, again, with the normal uh, mice, uh, with normal micro microglia, here's the amyloid plaque, right? If you manipulate the microglia and they don't function well, then that's what the plaque looks like. And you can see this at four months, this at eight months. You can see how it's just more diffuse here. It's more spread out, right? And it's way more concentrated in the functioning microglia situation. And the reason for that is we think that this might be a protective function and they're surrounding this plaque uh, as a form of containment. So it's not spreading out into the brain parenchyma and causing more damage. All right, so this is in the amyloid state. Let's go back. Now, when the tau proteins start to develop, right, now we're on this side, um, then there's a different story. We do see a lot of microglia, uh, increase in microglia, microgliosis, that's what it means. But associated with that is neurodegeneration. And if you manipulate the microglia so they don't work well, right, then you don't really see as much neurodegeneration. So in the, um, let me get to this slide. In Alzheimer's, microglia are at first protective in the amyloid phase, but when we get to the tau phase, they may be actually causing more damage. Because now they're in that M1 state, very inflammatory state. Okay, and they may be actually um, helping with the neuronal loss and damage. Okay, so what I want to point out is that then the time that you're looking at the um, uh, macrophages is really important. Is this in the beginning of the disease? Is this late stage? Because they're doing different things at different times. So just to say, well, it's doing X, well, you have to say, well, at what time? Okay. Let's look at the intestines. Here we have different subsets of uh, macrophages. Now I'm going to point out that the purple ones here, you can see, right, are actually monocyte derived, remember from the bone marrow. And we used to say, or we used to think that you really didn't have long surviving tissue resident macrophages in the intestines. Uh, the feeling was that they would come from the embryo and then it land in this tissue and it developed, but really very shortly after that they die off and that they are mostly replaced by these uh, monocytes, okay, from the bone marrow. It turns out that that is true for most of the macrophages, but the ones that are down here in the muscularis part of the intestines, uh, these are in contact with the enteric nervous system. They're in contact with the nerves uh, right here in, in the uh, myenteric plexus. And these ones tend to be uh, the tissue resonant macrophages from that embryonic yolk sac. Okay, so it's preserved. We didn't know this for a long time. We thought everything had you know, converted to this monocyte layer. So again, you may, have monos uh, you may have macrophages, but where they are is really important. And I think it's particularly interesting that the ones that are in contact with the nervous system, with neurons, are the ones that are the tissue resident ones. Okay? So if we look at this uh, study, which I found really uh, interesting, it's, it's quite commonly known that if you have an infection in your gut, that you could um, develop you know, a post-infectious uh, constipation state. Okay? So, and, and that will actually continue for maybe months beyond the disease state, uh, the, the, the infection itself. So you've actually given the antibiotics, you've gotten rid of the pathogen, but you still have this delayed um, motility in the gut and constipation. So in the homeostatic state, meaning, you know, under normal circumstances. Here are the neurons, right? Again, in that muscularis layer. And here are, again, the macrophages here, okay? Now, when you have infection, what happens is that you have massive neuronal death, okay? So these neurons then die off. And as a result, it uh, changes the motility in your gut and you get that. Uh, constipation that a lot of people will call, you know, irritable bowel, and they have the constipation um, uh, form of it. 
However, if you have enough uh, functioning uh, tissue resident macrophages here, then they can exert a protective oops, program such that we, yeah, you still get a little bit of neuronal loss here, but look, we've preserved some, right? We've preserved some of these neurons. And you can see that these macrophages, the tissue resident macrophages in particular, are really important in housekeeping, in um, protective uh, programs for the, for the cells in your body. So losing those macrophages would be really bad. Now, that was in the ileum, which is in the small intestine. Let's look at a different part of your intestines. This is in the distal colon. You see these green things here? What the heck are these things? So if you think about this as the lumen, this is where the, the, you know, the, the center of the tube, if you think of your colon as a tube, is, um, then this would be the epithelial lining, okay? That one cell lining here. Um, the colon is usually uh, mostly for water uh, reabsorption, okay? Because most of your nutrients are reabsorbed in the small intestine. So in, in the colon, we're trying to absorb water, right? So what are these little projections that are sticking out? Um, and it turns out that they are actually these little projections that are called balloon-like projections, so that's what BLP stands for, that are sticking out from macrophages that are in the intestinal wall. Now, if you have, um, a, a, if you look at, at, at these animals that have been wiped out of uh, their macrophage populations in this part of the gut, then what you see in red are this death of the uh, epithelial cells, the lining of the intestines. So you have massive death if you don't have macrophages there. Right? And it turns out what happens is, is quite an interesting matter here. So as I said, we're mostly absorbing water right, going in. And at the same time, here's this little macrophage. And it is sending out these little balloons, kind of like sampling. So it's taking, instead of taking that big bite, it's taking little tastes. So this is the tasting uh, macrophage. And what is it tasting? It's tasting the luminal contents. What's going on here? And if you have fungus, in this, in this study, they had a fungus that was out here. Right? And we have all our microbiota out here in this layer. If you have fungus there, uh, this particular fungus is actually secreting a toxin. Right? And as soon as the macrophage detects the toxin, what it does is it tells the intestinal cells, stop absorbing any of the water because it's poisoned. Right? Don't take any of that in. And as a result, you protect those epithelial cells. Here, where you deplete the macrophages so they're non-existent, right, then um, that uh, the cells keep absorbing the water, but they absorb it together with the toxin, and as a result, they die. You have massive death of those um, cells that are lining your gut. Right? Thank God for macrophages. Right? Okay. All right. Staph aureus. Staph aureus is a um, bacteria, and um, you know it's colonized on our bodies in the skin, maybe in your nose. Right? Uh, unfortunately, if uh, it gets through your skin or gets into your body, you can develop uh, pretty serious infections. They could be in your respiratory tract, you could have skin infections, and it could even be, you know, uh, in your brain, right? And this is very serious. You could die from this. Now, we also have a form called MRSA. Some of you may have heard of that, methicillin-resistant staph aureus, simply because we use a lot of antibiotics, and now they're really, really smart, and they know how to evade those antibiotics. So those antibiotics don't work against them. <coughs> Even very powerful antibiotics don't work against them. And um, since we can't kill them, and they are in your body, they may then flood your bloodstream. That's a condition called sepsis, right? And that is usually fatal if it's untreated, okay? So not a good situation, as we can all you know, tell. So now, when you think about sepsis, and certainly when I worked in the ICU, you think about, well, it's a blood infection. So hopefully, hopefully, fingers crossed, the white blood cells in your blood will kill the bacteria. And, and uh, you know, we're, that's what we're thinking, and that's what we've thought for a long time. Turns out that's not the case. They're really not um, killed in the blood. Here is what happens. 
Okay? What you're seeing, the, the, the purple would be the Kupfer cells in your liver, and basically they catch the bacteria that is in the blood. And they sequester the bacteria and then they kill them. If you look carefully, you'll see they start ingesting them already. Yeah? Right? Most of the bacteria in your blood, greater than 90% will be caught by these Kupfer cells. And they are protecting you from sepsis. All right? Something we never suspected. So they do protect enteric neurons and epithelial cells in the gut, and they are important in survival from septic uh, infections. Ah, my latest um, crush, the GATA6 macrophages. Okay, these, I was delighted to discover them. So GATA6 macrophages are what are known as cavity-associated macrophages. Uh, we have different cavities in our body, the uh, pericardial cavity around the heart, pleural cavity around the lungs, and the peritoneal cavity around the organs, right, in your abdomen. So you can see the developing embryo here, and it closes up, and now we form this little hole, and most of the organs are contained within. This is really the peritoneal cavity. And we find that the macrophages, oh yeah, there are macrophages even in cavities, okay? And um, now, when you talk to people uh, in immunology, the general thought is that macrophages don't work, don't move very quickly. They're very boring. They hardly move at all. So let's see if that's true. <laughs> yeah, this is really, really fast, okay? Macrophage flow inside the peritoneal cavity. And it turns out that those uh, macrophages they're called GATA6 because all um, cavity-associated macrophages express this transcription factor called GATA6. But anyway, GATA6 uh, macrophages are really the ones that are involved in, re in, in, in protecting and um, repairing any tissue damage. So here in this study, what they did was they injured the liver. They had a thermal injury here, right? And they thought at first that they would see the Kupfer cells, remember those famous Kupfer cells in purple, um, you know, coming to the rescue. And uh, they had to, uh, they, they waited in vain because those Kupfer cells weren't doing anything. But it turned out that the GATA6 cells in the peritoneal cavity uh, flooded to the site and started a repair process there. Okay, and you can see that right here. So at one hour post-injury, and the white lines denote the area of injury. Uh, you see this already cluster of macrophages, and then by 12 hours, they're all here. And uh, they're really covering the damaged area, clearing out the dead cells, and helping to regenerate that tissue. Right? And this is, uh, again, similar if you have a, uh, an injury to the abdominal wall, which is shown here in the blue. Right? Then you have cells that are dead seen here in green, and as right after that you see the, this flood, a swarm of these macrophages from the peritoneal cavity um, uh, clustering around that area, and you're going to just see the video, right? And the green again are dead cells that they will kind of surround and start to now clear away. Okay, uh, I know there's at least one surgeon in the room, Dr. Broderick, uh, and so you must know about adhesions. Every surgeon hates them. About 4% of uh, abdominal and pelvic surgeries will result in this con condition called adhesions. And essentially, it's scar tissue that's forming between organ surfaces or between organs and the abdominal wall. And they really are... Um, you know, a, a huge problem for, for surgeons. They cause um, small bowel obstruction, the number one cause of secondary infertility in women as well, okay? And for a long time, we didn't know how they formed. Well, guess what? It's the GATA6 again. So you have injury here, and then you have these peritoneal macrophages aggregating and forming this kind of a bridge between the surfaces of organs or... or you know, organ and, and maybe abdominal wall here. And then you deposit clots and collagen and other connective tissue, and eventually you have formation of adhesions, and then the blood vessels and nerves get uh, put into that as well, right? So another action of macrophages. So they protect tissue from injury and are important in clearing debris, but they can also cause post-surgical adhesions. And if you think about that post-surgical adhesion situation, 
it's really part of a wound healing situation gone bad, right? Because they're trying to lay down collagen and repair, but it's, it's in the wrong place and wrong circumstances. All right, so uh, because I see a lot of obesity, let's talk about macrophages in the fat. These brown structures are classically known as crown-like structures. They kind of look, they don't look like crowns to me. They look like gunk, but okay. Crown-like structures that surround, and these clear cells are fat cells, okay? Now, we have known for a long time that the more of these brown structures that you see, the crown-like structures, or CLS, the more of these that you see, then uh, the unhealthier the, the fat tissue. Okay, so the belief was for a long time that these were kind of M1 inflammatory macrophages and that they were causing dysfunction in the fat, okay, promoting obesity and metabolic disease. It turns out that it's not the case. These cells are trying to clear dead fat cells, right? And, uh, you know, if we overwhelm them, and we give them a, a lot of uh, dead fat cells and they can't keep up with the work, then you start to generate a, a pro-inflammatory uh, environment that now stimulates other macrophages to become really inflammatory. Okay? So again, we're seeing what we thought was an inflammatory uh, response, but it really was an anti-inflammatory uh, uh, kind of housekeeping response. It was trying to clear up the dead debris. Now, this is just to show you that in fat tissue alone, there are at least seven subsets of macrophages. Wow. Okay, and if you look here, surface markers, they're very different. And that's how we recognize that they're different populations. Okay, does anyone see M1, M2 here? <laughs> now, no, right? Because I told you it doesn't exist because in some circumstances, it may seem to have more inflammatory action. In some circumstances, it could be more wound healing, right? And if the wound healing has gone bad, it could be fibrotic and scarring, okay? So uh, anti-inflammatory is not necessarily good in all circumstances. That's really important to remember. So this is pretty recent and quite exciting from 2017. And what this study, uh, shows is, for the longest time we thought, we've, we've always known that when you have sympathetic nerves, they secrete norepinephrine or noradrenaline, which is a neurotransmitter, and this effect on fat cells would be to break down fat, so you can mobilize fat for energy, okay? But we always thought that this was a systemic effect. In other words, it was happening through um, the bloodstream, right? And, uh, you know, then the fat cells pick it up. We've now learned that actually fat tissue is well innervated by uh, 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 sympathetic nerves. And next to these sympathetic nerves, which are shown here in red, and here's a close-up, right, are these macrophages, okay? And when we have um, normal action of those sympathetic nerves, here's the fat cells, right? And they secrete the norepin, sorry, fat cells and the sympathetic nerves are impacting it by secreting norepinephrine and causing the fat to break down so you can use it for energy. However, if these specific macrophages insert themselves between the fat cells and the nerves, and these nerves are actually in direct contact with these cells, but if these macrophages insert themselves there, then something very different happens. Uh, let me go back. What happens is that they take up the norepinephrine that are secreted by these nerves, right, the, the, the neurons, and they basically swallow it and degrade it. So the fat cells never see the norepinephrine, they never see the noradrenaline, so they never break down, okay? And it really it doesn't matter what you do because normally if you, you ran around, you would have a lot more sympathetic nerve action, you'd have a lot of secretion of adrenaline, right? And you would break down fat. But in this case, because the macrophages are absorbing the, the adrenaline, the noradrenaline, then the fat cells don't see it and they can't break down, right? And this impacts obesity, obviously. Um, I'm, I'm gonna skip this one. And this one's the, I think, pretty much last one I find really interesting, also in fat cell. And we see that in the lean state, um, we found that now fat cells are transferring their mitochondria to macrophages. And this somehow keeps uh, the animal in a healthy state. This is in lean animals. But if we prevent the transfer of mitochondria, 
uh, from the fat cell to the macrophages, then we have increase in obesity. Okay? And here, they studied these animals in metabolic cages, so they noted all the intake and activity and accounted for all of it. And um, in red, you see those animals with actually the prevention of mitochondrial transfer to the macrophages, and their litter mate controls are in black. And you see that they have less energy expenditure as measured by heat output over time even though they were eating the same amounts and they were exercising the same. Okay, so summary here, I hope the takeaway for you is that immune cells are involved not just in resistance, we're always talking about resistance and fighting infection, but they're also involved in tolerance and in homeostasis, right, in maintaining the health of your tissues. And macrophages are really important in the pathogenesis of many, 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 I would say most chronic diseases. And when you're talking about macrophages, you have to consider sex differences, space, time, um, and, and, and look at different macrophage phenotypes. They're not all the same. So um, I said I hoped I would answer the questions of what they are and why we should study them, right? And if you look up the macrophage times, this is from uh, April of this year, uh, we look at sympathetic uh, sprouting and how it uh, induces changes in macrophages to protect against pancreatic cancer. I didn't even talk about tumor-associated macrophages, okay? So they are everywhere, and they are your best friend, <laughs> all right? So you've been a marvelous, splendid audience. I'm happy to take questions at this point. Can you please tell us which of the American vaccines are the most macrophage friendly? Uh, I don't think we consider macrophage. We haven't really been considering macrophage in, in terms of um, pharmaceuticals, which is a huge problem, right? Because we're not looking at the basic science and what's happening at the cellular level. And how do we address that um, in, in the pathogenesis of disease? So, you know, you brought up a big problem, and there are certain medications that might actually impact macrophage states and polarization, uh, but we definitely need a whole lot more studies to look at that. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I missed the instructions there. Um, I just want to thank you for putting this in layman terms. I could follow what you were saying, so thank you for making it You're understandable. Welcome. It's a pleasure. Go ahead. Do the different macrophages operate independently? So is there something that improves the performance of one while degrading the performance of others? Or your eyeballs can be doing Mighty Mouse while your brain is doing Mickey Mouse? So again, where the macrophages are, right, they're influenced by the local environment greatly. Now, a big problem in macrophage research is it's really hard to tell which macrophages we're dealing with. First of all, we, we, we started with the M1, M2 kind of uh, terminology, right? And then um, we have the tissue resident and oh, these ones come from the bone marrow, right? Then they started naming them uh, lambs, lipid-associated macrophages, TAMs, tumor-associated macrophages, DAMs, damage-associated microglia, right? SAMs, sympathetic-associated macrophages. Well, well, you know, how do they relate? Are we talking about the same cells, the same subset of macrophages? We don't know. So now we're looking at biomarkers and trying to really distinguish, you know, different subsets, and um, th they're more than we realize, right? So it's, uh, just that basic work is going to take some time. Go ahead, over there. Uh, let me pull back from my macrophages and, and thank you for the lecture. That was wonderful. I didn't quite get that last slide about fat cells, but let me pull back just a little bit. I also see you're board certified in obesity medicine, and that's one of your specialties. <coughs> That's obviously America's pandemic and will continue to be for the foreseeable future. Is there anything wonderful coming down the, the pike on dealing with obesity? I also see that 
one of your interests is preventive medicine and obesity. Preventive medicine seems kind of juxtaposed. But anything cutting edge that we can look forward to treating, dealing with obesity in this country? I mean, obviously, they're looking at different approaches. Um, one would be to look at these different subsets of macrophages and how they impact your metabolism, right? Uh, I, you, you said that you didn't quite understand the last one, probably on the mitochondrial transfer. And I will say that most people don't understand, and it's mind-boggling. When I read that paper, you know, I had to pause for several hours just to take it in because it was mind-boggling. And then, you know, to learn about uh, macrophages and how they may be actually taking uh, mitochondria from, let's say, fat cells and transferring them to other cells, to your heart, to, you know, other organs in your body. This is something that's mind-blowing. And, um, you know, I think that next phase will be to look at what is happening with mitochondrial transfer, right? So there's so many things that we don't know. So we could look at macrophages. We could look at browning of fat. Because if you have brown fat, which is a different type of fat, that's more metabolically um, active, right? So that could increase your energy expenditure that way because you're, you're losing um, energy in the form of heat. So um, I think, and you can, you can increase browning with cold exposure, with caloric restriction. So there are different ways that you can manipulate that, right? So, you know, there's still a lot to learn. Um, but right now, I think we still need to focus on the basic science, at least where macrophages are concerned. I'm convinced that they're really quite involved in the development of, of obesity. Go ahead, over there. About 10 years ago, I started avoiding omega-6, which is an inflammatory fat that makes up part of the uh, cell membrane. Uh, I, in three weeks, I lost 15 pounds. Uh, ultimately, I lost 60 pounds. That 60 pounds has stayed off for 10 years. Uh, have you looked at how omega-6 might be influencing the condition of these uh, macrophages? Yeah, so they do. So we have these lipid-associated macrophages, and they take up, as you can tell from the name, fats, right, lipids. And um, certain lipids seem to be more inflammatory. Again, that's a huge area of research. Um, you know, if you want to do macrophage work, right, it's everything in medicine. So, um, you know, some of the manipulations that they did uh, to, to change the expression of genes in macrophages was through um, TREM2 and APOE genes. And these are associated with how uh, fats are processed. So yeah, th there's a lot of work in that category of lipid-associated macrophages now. Go ahead. Hi, I have a question about um, osteoarthritis. So I'm glad you clarified that microphages are my friend because I was trying to figure out if they were. And can, because a lot of that is my joints are inflamed and pretty much it, there's nothing they can do for me. And I, I feel it progressively getting worse. So I'm thinking, well, is there a synthetic microphage you can inject in my hand? I mean, I'm willing to be the test monkey. Like, I think right now, so you're asking the right questions. How do we induce macrophages to be, let's say, in the more M2 wound healing phase and less aggressive and less inflammatory, right? We, ha we need to learn the local conditions because it's not just we give this, this, and this because it depends on the tissue, it depends on the timing, and so forth, right? And in terms of regeneration of tissue, uh, it might be, it turns out, that instead of the stem cells kind of taking hold and developing into the new tissue, it might be that the, the, the macrophages are transferring their mitochondria to the old cells and rejuvenating them. That's now the thought, right, in regeneration work. We don't know. So many questions and so exciting. I'm glad you are hooked on macrophages now. <laughs> I hope. I'm going to be asking my doctor about that, actually. <laughs> yeah. Other questions? I think one over there. OK, I'm glad. You know, I got everyone on the macrophage tour bus. <laughs> so you talk about the macrophages um, migrating to different parts of the body. But you also said that they're not found in the blood. So how do they get? They, they are in the blood. Oh, uh, they are. They are in the blood. But um, you know, the majority of them are really in tissue, 
And I actually believe it's uh, mostly in, in the intestines, in your gut. Got it. Thanks. Yeah. <clears throat> On that informative note, let's thank our speaker. <laughs>